Welcome back. It's still the Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. And of course, um, uh, we're moving on with our program. And uh, first conversation, of course, as we earlier advertised, um, talking about security or insecurity um, in the country. Uh, a review um, of media reports by News Outfit Premium Times has shown that at least 103 people were killed by non state actors in Nigeria in the last week. And this is from March 6 to March 12, 2022. Very grim statistics, if you ask. The review says that last week's killings indicate a massive increase of over 900% when compared uh, with the previous week of when 10 persons were killed. 900%. The figure of the previous week was the lowest in the year 2022, by the way. Now, out of the 103 uh, people who were killed, 24 were security personnel consisting of 18 soldiers and six police officers, while the remaining 79 were civilians. Now, most of the killings occurred in KB State, Northwest Nigeria, while others were recorded in a few other states. No incident was recorded in Zamfara State, Sokoto State, or Niger State, which are arguably uh, the epicenter of the banditry in the country. Two persons were killed in Kaduna State, uh, 82 in Kebi, including at least uh, 63 vigilantes from five communities who were confirmed dead after bandits ambushed them on Sunday evening. Uh, two days after the outlaws, after the outlaws on Tuesday again killed 18 soldiers and six policemen in the entourage of the Kebi State Deputy Governor Sumaila Samaila Yumbe. Now, 12 deaths were recorded in Katsina State. Seven children reportedly killed in a stampede of residents fleeing from bandits in Shimfida. That's in Jabia local government area. Now, also in Katsina State, five passengers lost their lives while three others were severely uh, wounded when bandits opened fire on a moving vehicle in Yan Tumaki, that's in, uh, on the Dan Musa Road, on Saturday morning. In Ogun State, yet to be identified assailants. Also uh, on Monday, set ablaze the Bale of Olowe uh, Bagura in Nabekota uh, North local government area. Uh, following the incident in KB State, President Muhammad Buhari, in a statement by his uh, spokesperson, Gaba Shehu, condemned the killings. The president, while reacting to the incident, vowed to put an end to the killings by bandits in the northwestern part of the country well the question is can he and will he very glad to say joining us this morning on breakfast is a security consultant ambassador dr wami and roy ohidevi he is uh, uh, our guest on the program this morning ambassador great to have you join us today thank you i don't know if i can still smile without your opening um, narrative Thank really, you. Really sad indeed. Um, um, so, so, so what I, what I, what's your answer to that question? The president has reacted by condemning the situation, the incident in KB State. Um, really, really sad one. The, the bandits held the security operatives in a convoy of the deputy governor in a gun battle for two hours and more. And when they left, at least 18 of them were gone. Um, the president has condemned it and he's vowing to address the banditry in the Northwest, which seems to have taken over and exceeded the insurgency in the Northeast. Your thoughts on that? Well, um, to be direct, let's try to really look at it directly. Now, if you see when you make comments as a president, is there commensurate action? Now, action in the sense that um, the, the situation we found ourselves in Nigeria, we have since been talking about it. We have been insinuating all the un, unwholesome uh, opportunities for politicians, the um, religious activities, ethnic violence activities, to influence security agencies. You know, even the judiciary has not even helped. All the institutions are comatose. You know, it's only when you go to Abuja or you make a phone call to some certain persons that you can make some things happen in the country. You know, so we, we, if, you, if you want to follow the president's statement, you are supposed to see appropriate recruitment processes for our security agencies. You are supposed to see proper remuneration. You are supposed to see discipline 
for airing officers and agency personnel. You are supposed to see a, a rich curriculum that is ready to articulate the current insecurity, global insecurity. You know, you are supposed to see logistics properly applied, you know, and you are supposed to see promotion and control of deployment of personnel being in the hands of the responsibility of every agency, the army, the, the, the military, the, the DSS, you know, they should be in charge. Then you are supposed to see a judiciary that should respect judicial expectations, you know, a government that is people-centered. But that is not what we have. That has brought us to where we are today, that local government chairmen, um, OBAS, AMIs, village chiefs, they are now among in the criminality, they are complicit. Some of them have been arrested. You know, we have worship centers, both the Imam and the Christians. Now you see pastors and Imams being complicit in kidnapping and drugs. You know, you see government personnel, security agencies, senior officers, military, police being complicit in kidnapping, um, financial fraud. So. Where do you think a government, a president, making such a statement should start from? It should start from making people accountable. So you, so you would say now, because uh, let's even start from that part. I mean, the issue of security, for every time we get to talk about it, one would say that we need to look at it the way it is, in its real sense. It affects everybody. Like everybody, it has nothing to do with whether you're, you belong to a certain political party, PDP, APC, and what have you. So um, how would you describe the real issue right here? Because if you look at it, the country as we are, uh, 36 states, including the FCT, so you're saying 37, the security concerns are not the same in different parts of the country. So you have in the North is the issue of banditry, kidnap, and uh, you know, Boko Haram insurgency in that side. And to other parts, you have in the, you know, the Southeastern region where you have IPOP issues, uh, those who are agitating for uh, self-governance. And then to different parts, you have the issue of maybe banditry, uh, farmer headers uh, clash, uh, kidnappings, and what have you. We're not saying that the society should be entirely free of all of this crime, but to some extent, it should be safe. So um, how would you really, really describe, what would you say the problem is with us? Being that, if you look at the, this current administration, the president came on you know, the grounds that he was going to solve the insecurity issues. If you look at some of the issues, security, corruption, and economy, Seven years and counting, it feels like we have gone back to, I really don't know where we really are right now. It's no longer safe. Babies are now being carried. And because in some of these states, I'm sorry that I'm taking long. In some of these states, for instance, just uh, some days back, there's a baby who was in the dispatch you know, box and taken around the area of Shongutaido. But the president, should we blame the president for that as well? So how do we really describe this problem that we're facing? What exactly is the problem here? OK, um, I like, you, you were not too long. You were trying to capture the scenario. You know, the scenario is bleak. Now, if you want to go a little back, let's just try to save time. You will see that um, Nigerians got into politics and weaponized violence. The first time we got into politics, it was to break bottles, snatch ballot buses, and engrave the elbows of people that could cause mayhem. You know, later we promoted them to call them godfathers. So they were the ones that would decide who becomes this. And we started to destroy the articulate um, relevance of INEC. You know, so ballot counting does not count anymore. It was truncated. It was moved from one place to the other, infused with negative boxes, votes. Then you now see politicians looking at hoodlums as their own armies. Creating armies became a skill to be recognized as a good politician. So when you can just blow a whistle, boys come in and scatter everywhere. Didn't know we were creating a model called political terrorism. You know, because we wanted to use politics to intimidate and cause fear. 
So we created these hoodlums, we armed them, we gave them superiority over security agencies. Now, it's cutting across the whole country. Remember, no APC or PDP in Nigeria now, because they all move from party to party. Even after a party voted you into office as a governor, as a senator, the next week he's moving to another party. How? You understand? So we have seen all of this, and now we needed to discuss the gray areas. We agree, as you said, there's insecurity everywhere. So, but we need to mitigate it. We need to curb it. We need to put it under rain. Okay, so we need to discuss. So if we want to discuss anything insecurity in the Niger Delta area, we need to look for who can discuss, who can represent the people. And the people that were pushed forward to represent the north, the south, the east, they were all scams. They were interested in helping themselves. When you say they're scams, what, what yes, scam is a scam is a is a decoy. A scam is a, is deployed to confuse, to misdirect. You know, so these were people that came to Asorok anytime, any day came to a round table anytime, any day, discussing national is issues, but putting their personal interests in front. So the people were not properly represented. So gradually, dividends of democracy pushed to the NDDC did not get to the Niger Delta. Go and look at the roads. Go and look at that. Dividends of democracy pushed to the north could not get to the masses. The Amajeri militant and uh, mili military and uh, militant groups, all of them grew up. So you took it up know? from 1999. No, I'm just building a cartel yeah. quickly for you, you know? So all of these things grew up. So the people became agitated. And unfortunately for them, these cabals that hold Nigeria that make decisions. From, from a governor, you become a, a senator. From a senator, after eight years, some are coming back to say they want to be a governor, a president. From there, they go and be an ambassador. Okay, so they were looking for immunity for the misrepresentation they were doing, not knowing that the people agitation was growing. Children started growing with disgruntled hearts. So a bike man can carry a child. A six years old can carry a gun. A 18 years old can use his mother for rituals because everybody has seen that there is no law and order, breakdown of law and order, anarchy reigns, and there is no institution to curb it. So basically, it's the issue you want to say that it's not that we don't have what it takes to address the issue, but it's the fact that there's uh, you know, there's no willpower to uh, enforce obedience well, and make there. arrests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, when I joined the Nigerian army, I was, I was so impressed. If there is a, a traffic break um, hold up somewhere and you just see a soldier come down with just his belt, everybody will just behave themselves. You know, if you are taken to the police station, you are begging because from the police station, one or two evidence put together straight to court. And you see a lawyer, you respect a lawyer so much because you know that he stands for justice. You know, I'll call my lawyer and you are begging the guy, don't call your lawyer. But nowadays, all those institutions have dilapidated trust. They've been eroding. You know? So the, 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 the erosion of trust, competency, relevance is what we are now. So you take me to the police station, I'm already calling another police to call that police, to call this police and share money. And you, that is the complainant, become the accused. It's not the police fault. It's the institutions that are supposed to control them. Look at Abakiari's case, just as a small example. Where is the office of the IG? When a police officer was on social media, was showing affluence, where is the police service commission? Where are the areas? What about the military? Those generals that were caught with billions, that you see them building, buying houses in Abuja, transferring wealth. Banks are supposed to know when certain amount of money move. As a staff, a certain amount of money gets into your account, it's supposed to be blocked. You are not supposed to get more than that. You know, so what happened to those financial controls, ICPC, all of those institutions? So if we don't control the institutions, make them accountable for people that default on policies, regulations, criteria to hold office, then we continue to encourage the masses, the youths, the teenagers that are coming to visionize being like you. Interesting. So, so you, you, you've, um, you've, you've, uh, you know, connected, and you can't say we can't. You're saying we can't talk about insecurity in isolation. It, it has connect, connecting dots to other issues in that larger country. You've talked about corruption. You've talked about discipline. You've talked about morality. Um, uh, uh, Muhammad Buhari came to 
office in 2015 um, on expectations that um, being a, a former general who has a track record of um, fighting indiscipline and the corruption will be a thing of the past. She would talk about security. He was the one who was against the orders of the then president, Sheo Shagari, Chase Mitasine, into another country, Chad. And it was ended in a few hours or days. Um, so this was the expectation. What went wrong? Well, um, as a military officer, if you give an order today, for the next 10 years after you leave, the order still stands. There's a joke that some men were found guarding a, a, a molded chair in a barrack. Soldiers were guarding it. Just a chair. They clean it and they pose there with their rifle. It's a joke. But someone came to finally ask, why are they putting guards on a, on a concrete chair? You know? And they asked all the commanders. And by the time they got to the commander that gave the instruction, he said he put those soldiers there because the concrete was wet. He wanted them to protect it. So the military might, the military discipline was what um, President Mohamed Abouari was hatching on. Not knowing that in the civil space, in a democracy, you needed your officers, you needed your action desk, you needed your institutions. The NMPC, the Ministry of this, the health sector, the judicial sector, you needed helmsmen to hold your vision of um, and security, no, no crime, no corruption, no this, no that. You needed to place people there. You cannot just be at Asurok as the president and say there won't be corruption in Nigeria. It's not possible. Why? Because every officer has their cascading office roles. So that was the first error that the president had to believe that if he comes in as a model of no corruption, no insecurity, man of no nonsense, it will hold water. It won't hold water. So people started to create insecurity in different places. Insecurity are the world of the day, and all you need to do is now to call somebody. There was a time he called one IG to report to the um, front lines. He didn't go. He was in Abuja, and nothing was done. Those were the times that he, be, he should begin to see that officers were relevant to your corporate vision. Okay, so uh, let's look at it from this angle. Uh, there's been a lot of argument about you know, the personnel. You have mentioned it, and some people say that it's because we don't have enough personnel uh, you know, to police the entire country. If you want to look at uh, the number of police officers policing over 200 million Nigerians or plus Nigerians, you're looking at 300, about 300,000 or plus. And so that's not even enough. According to the UN uh, recommendation, we're hoping that you have, uh, you know, 600 police, at, you know, uh, 600, one police officer policing about maybe 180 or thereabout. But in this case, we're looking at one police officer policing about 600 persons. So the issue of you know, the manpower, the strength, is a major issue. I will cite a typical example. When the hashtag NSAS protest started, and those who hijacked the system, because of course it started as a very peaceful process until you had some element who took over the entire protest in different parts of the state. Yes, I was you know, in the southern part of the country at that time. And I put a call to you know, the PR of police. Uh, in the state. And she said, we don't have men. We don't have men. We don't have men. The fire here, you know, there, there's nobody, uh, the police station has been set up, please. Apart from that, the fact that they don't have men. And I felt so sorry for myself because I saw some persons who were going to set a feeling station ablaze. And so there was, so what, what, what could one do? So this is just the scenario saying that could it also be that the reason why we're grappling with all of this insecurity is that we don't have enough personnel in terms of police officers? Well, um, in an emergency situation, you are supposed to make do with what you have. It is um, proactive to begin to think of situations to put yourself that we call emergency situations. It is reactive to begin to look for solutions when you are in an emergency. Now we are in an emergency. But let me just take a cue from what you have said. Look at, there are people. Look, the value of the officer determines the number that you need, ma. The value. Now, if I have 10 men and just three people can do the job of that 10 men, look at the 
the value of the remuneration of a police officer. Not only the salary, accommodation, look at the health care for his family, things that will make him comfortable to, to project himself forward. Now, those are not there. Then you begin to look at the logistics provided, the current insecurity situation, and the technological level that we should be executing right now. We see it on TV, we see it on Google, but it's not appropriately deployed in our policing, in our military activities, okay? Now, you look at the quality of personnel after you look at the remuneration to attract the quality you want. And I ask a simple question. These guys that you see driving logistics bikes that are intelligent enough, these guys that are doing cyber crimes that are intelligent enough, do you know how many Nigerian graduates that read criminology and security studies? Do you know how many university does criminology and security studies for five years and they graduate every year? Now, if you take this number of people, send them SMS. If you want to join the police, please meet us at so-and-so place. Take that number of people, send them SMS, military, DSS. They will come out. These are graduates of five years, maybe seven years if we have ASU strike. Now, these are people that are also riding Okada. These are people that are doing security in my company and so many other persons' company. That their brains are full of ideas, but the opportunity to deploy it is, is restricted. Now, if you do that, you have curbed the fake um, recruitment system that is going on now. Do you know what's going on? They call one guy and say, we are recruiting. Do you have people, Rankadede, or uh, or guy from the East? Do you have people, or guy from Edo, or from Yoruba land? Do you have people? They send them people from their nooks and cranny. Even if he's not educated enough, even if he fails the exam, you will hear he was brought by XYZ person. Ah, director of plot CV sent him. Oh, that man, ah. You, you need to read. Though. When you join the military or the police, make sure you read all the time. And they put in these wrong pegs in wrong holes. And you see a lot of them becoming stooges, boys to one madam, like you saw carrying food for the woman, and all those kind of things that are irrelevant to the level of insecurity and the required intelligence, deployment of technology, and wishful patriotism. That is required. Anybody that went to invest in Nigeria to read criminology and security studies for five years, six years, seven years, if there is a strike, comes out, start writing Okrada, is patriotic. Hmm. So, wow. but um, ju just before I let Kofi come in, are you saying that the issue right here is not the issue of uh, numbers, but it's the fact that we've not been able to manage uh, the numbers that we have? Is that what you're saying? I said, if you need, no, we, we are talking about proactive and reactive. I mentioned that. So now we are in reactive. We are in reactive. So if you need men now, you need to look at what is the current deployment. How many men do you have? Have you heard when there's an Umbra election or where there's an election in Gombe? You hear 3,000 policemen were deployed to the state. Have you heard that before? Why so why don't you hear 20,000, 3,000 policemen? Do we have a proper statistics? of living officers that are good to go to be deployed in the front line. Do we know how many we have? Or we are following the media description? We don't know. So if you know how many you have, you will not know if they are appropriately deployed. How many did you say was following a governor? 16 soldiers or whoever, what was the statistics you mentioned? Yeah, you, you, are those yeah, the you, numbers? Yeah. I travel a lot. I see governors in, in Canada. I see governors in the US. I see people that hold office in buses, in trains with me. And I wonder, why is it that we don't do this in our country? If you are children's school in Nigeria, you will make sure the schools are good. You will make sure there is security around where they go to school, where they transverse. If you also understand that you need to visit your village, your local government that voted you into power at least twice in a month, you will make sure that place, as a criteria to hold office, you are not supposed to be in Abuja, you will make sure your village is secured. You know, you will make sure all of these things work. If you are supposed to follow economy, if you are supposed to follow the train that we built, it's not for the masses, it's for Nigerian citizens. If you are supposed to follow that train, you make sure the fuel is complete all the time. That there won't be stoppage on the road. You know, so no, because we have removed our, our, our leaders from utilizing 
the opportunities they gave us to enjoy democracy. It's like a, a like animal farm where some animals are greater than others. I, I like to, like to interesting, very interesting analysis. I like to um, share an experience uh, of some persons I know who travel through the southeast um, on the twentieth of February. One of them, a very popular guy in Port Harcourt, is still missing as we speak. His name is Steady Easy. Family is praying, friends are praying for him to return home. The next one is a very close person to me who traveled from Port Harcourt to Anambra, to a village for a traditional marriage. My heart was in my mouth because I know what's going on between the um, Abia, Imo border. And of course, you go through that road to get to Okigwe. The person moved from the entourage, the family convoy moved from Anambra to Asaba. Now, on making the trip from Asaba back to Port Harcourt, they had to go through the southeast because they realized that some roads were blocked by boys. So they diverted all the cars, diverted through a village, villages, through the bushes. And if I show you the messages and the accounts and the talk, the chat on the phone, it was gory. We're just praying that she makes it back home in one piece. There were reports of dead bodies seen on the street. There were reports of a human heart being seen on the street. There was no report of a single policeman seen. When they crossed in from Imo State into River State, we shouted hallelujah. Not a single policeman. Who did they see providing security in the southeast? Sir, vigilante boys, community boys. Now, there's a, there's, there's a suspicion that the young man who is being looked for has been kidnapped. So these community boys would stop the cars, the bus, they, they were driving a commercial vehicle, and ask for money. So they block the roads so that you divert through the villages and ask you for money. And if you don't pay, they cut the gun at you. They are armed. So we have an absence of police on the roads in almost the entire southeast as we speak today. And it's being run by community vigilantes and unknown gunmen. What, what, what's, what's the issue and how can we get out of this situation? Okay, you know, the issue of the South is, is just also, you need to understand that it's escalating beyond control. Because right now, children are seeing it as status quo. And my, all my fear all the time, because I talk to youths a lot, I talk to university students, I talk to schools, children. If you build that mindset in that catchment of Nigerians, you are going to be in a big trouble. Okay, so now, in those Northeast areas, well, I'm sorry, um, Eastern Shores that you're talking about. What is the problem? The problem now is people are saying they want Biafra and all that. What discussions are on the table? On the side of the Easterners, I have said it. What discussions are on the table? Who is discussing for you? Violence, violence, violence. Look at the military veterans. When we had all the disgruntlement, when I came out of the military, I joined forces with those I see have articulate ideas to defeat the, um, the maltreatment. Until date, you have not seen a situation where they said retired military people took out arms. We could, we can, we should, okay? With the level of decadence, people are dying every day. Our colleagues, we fought together, we survived, we retired from the military, they are dying. But because of control, there are articulate ways to interrogate all the grievances of the East. I have absolutely. had opportunities where Easterners got into the Senate. Okay. There are opportunities where I'm from that area too. So there are opportunities where we got into presidency. What have we done to put some laws into place? We do the NDDC. NDDC is used now to see for money. There are cases already. We are not speculating. You know, so if we have the violence um, front line, is it going to help us? How many uh, generations behind are we training to be violent? So I think that the discussion should be reawakened. The discussion should be pioneered by people that understand articulate interrogation of cases, people that have mediation and conciliation skills. I'm a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Mediation and Conciliation. When I left the army, I did a lot of things. You know, there are discussions that you could put forward, judiciary to hold ground, the Senate and the legislature to put in laws that will still benefit. So, so you're, you're saying we need to look at non-military solutions in the Southeast? Non-violent non solutions. Non-violent solutions. Yeah. Quickly, very quick, because of time. The Northeast. Um, was the problem. Now the Northwest is the problem. Banditry has exceeded terrorism. Very quickly, the solution. 
Well, the, the, we, we started to say we want to find out who people were, but we failed. We started to say we want to hold ground and refuse them to hoist flag. We're failing too. We started to say we want to do community resilience, which is to relate with the people, get intelligence from the people. But we are failing also because there are modes within the military, the police, and all other agencies. You know, so I think that where we should start from, from beginning to see what's going on, is there are mineral resources in those areas. Some of them are one of the reasons why this is being attractive. You remember the Niger Delta with the um, oil and the oil wells and all that. So if you look at the mineral resources, if you begin to put proper government regulations, resist this uh, mercenary kind of mining those minerals, refuse um, all these uh, hoodlums to hold ground, rotate and mobilize the military, police, whoever, NSCDC you send to those areas regularly so they don't become business owners in those places and um, penalize people found wanting. To you know, call it a <laughs> yeah. point in time, but I will just steal a few seconds. Now, there's no way we talk about the issue of security or insecurity without looking at the security. I mean, the structure of uh, policing. Uh, some people say the fact that we have a centralized uh, police structure is not helping decentralize it, let state control the architecture. Do you support this notion? And do you think this will help us? Uh, bring peace and some sort of security. So let me say state policing exactly. is being offered. I, I said, I still say it, I've said it in like seven years ago, I'm still saying it till date. State policing is fine, okay? But we don't have responsible government that is going to remove its claws from the state police, you know, that we not use it to intimidate. We don't have responsible government that we motivate the state police to the level of um, compliance that we expect. Let's take Lagos State for an example. They were coming with all these their internal system. The Lagos State and security, these guys that ride bicycles and wear this blue and you, you know that system is dying. You know, they have not imputed the right candidates. Then the teachers are not paid. Some state um, staff members are not paid. How will you pay those that carry arms? We need responsible governance. If you have responsible governance, I will be interested in state policing. Mm -hmm. We can't give a state government state police and it's not able to pay them, motivate them, and equip them. It will be a disaster. Thank you so much uh, for your time. It's been very interesting having you. Uh, on the program, uh, Ambassador Dr. Oami and Roy Ohidievier um, is a fellow of uh, the IIPS at some. He is also a security consultant and he's been our guest on uh, the breakfast this morning. Apologies. Uh, if we didn't Thank get you very right. much. Thank yes, um, you. But we've thoroughly enjoyed your analysis and hope to have you again soon. Thank you. And happy birthday in advance. Yeah, thank Tomorrow you. is his birthday. <laughs> All right, I don't know whether two of you plan to come at almost the same <laughs> time. I'm telling you, yes. <laughs> All right, it's still a breakfast, so we're back to talk some more right here on the program. Please stay with us.